So the final thing um, that we have to do is to take our assessment results and turn that into something that is going to be useful and create an individualized intervention plan for ourselves, our families, our organizations, whatever, again, whatever system it is that you're looking at, this tool is generally applicable to a variety of systems because every system has a, has a, every system has decisions to make. Every system exists to address problems or to prevent problems. And so this can, you know, the interve the assessment and the intervention plan can be individualized depending on whatever it is that you need specifically and that you're focused on. And um, so the book itself doesn't have like a, you know, first do this and then do this and, you know, here's this prescriptive intervention plan to address your problems. It doesn't do that and it shouldn't do that and it can't do that because systems are super complex and we, and there's no one solution. But what this book does and what these tools do is to help de define a framework in which we can make more informed decisions. And so what I did for myself and um, is to pull from my previous knowledge and my previous um, skills and strategies that I have employed in different areas and different systems in my life. And I tried to, I, and I used that process and applied it to this situation. So historically, and kind of what I've been trained to do and has, what has worked fairly well for me in the past when it comes to assessment results, and especially ones like this where it's not direct observation data, it's a rating scale that and it gives us a snapshot of what's happening and then looks at those things kind of broken out into different domains. What my general approach is, is to find or to identify the domains which are the most impacted. So maybe, you know, depending on the level of resources that you have available, and we're going to say, we're gonna kind of keep it reined in. We're only going to dedicate 10 to 20% of our resources to working on the problems. Because if we get hyper-focused and we put dedicate too many problem, too many resources to working on the problem, then we fall into a different trap, which is that we're not, we're not dedicating enough resources to working in the problem and taking action and do actually doing the things right we spend we're spending more time thinking about the doing and planning for the doing we're not spending a lot of time doing the doing and then we find ourselves in a similar set of problems so we choose one to two most impacted domains in each of those in and then in each of those domains we identify one, two, or three subdomains or sub areas that are the most highly impacted that we can prioritize for treatment, prioritize to address them. So um, what this, the exercise for this objective asks you to do is just that. So based on your assessment results, kind of pick out, kind of use this formula to pick out the areas that are the most highly impacted that you want to address and then develop a plan to um, protect yourself against future judgment areas related to those issues. So 
when I, you know, when I did my assessment and developed, you know, put together re the results, what do I, what I identified was that these two areas, self evaluations and strategic evaluations were the most significantly impacted. They were both at 80% or above. And the, that was higher than the other two scores. And so it's, uh, the point here is not that it had, you know, meets that 80% criteria. It's just of the four domains, these were the two most highly rated areas. So that is indicative of these are the two areas in which there are the, the most amount of problems. So the other two areas had problems in them, but again, we're trying to narrow down our focus and to specifically focus on those those issues that are the most impactful, the most pressing, um, because if we focus on those, we can do a couple things. Those are the biggest issues. They, um, they're, it's potentially that if we address those issues that are the biggest ones, there's going to be collateral effects and collateral improvements in the other areas, and we won't um, have to specifically address areas in those problems. Sorry, we won't specifically have to address problems in those areas. Okay, so my two main domains are self-evaluations and strategic evaluations, and then within each of those domains, these are the specific biases or subdomains of that competency. And so then my next step is to identify the two, you know, one, two, or three specific subdomains which within those domains which are scored highest, which, which are relatively higher compared to the other scores. Again, there are many issues that we can deal with. These are, you know, there are scores of 80, which are high scores, but I have two that are two in, under self-evaluations that are rated as 100 and three under strategic evaluations that which are rated as 100. And so those are the ones that I have pulled out as areas that should be targeted first in relation to our priorities for intervention, for our targets of, the, of that dedicated 10 to 20% of resources to address our core, our core issues that are causing our organization or our system to have the most problems. So in the areas, area of self-evaluations, overconfidence and blind spot bias were the two most highly rated. And in the area of strategic evaluation, IKEA effect, illusory truth, and normalcy were the three key areas that I identified as needing to be addressed, needing to be thought about and planned for um, in terms of intervention planning. So, so then once we identify those things, we need to dig a little bit deeper into each of those individual biases and identify the strategies which are indicated as most likely to be impactful at addressing or overcoming those barriers or those biases or de-biasing them. And so in the book, in each of the chapters related to those biases, at the end of every chapter, there were you know, suggestions for strategies, intervention strategies that would be effective or applicable to addressing those challenges. And so what, you know, what we will do now is to kind of pull those in to make a plan. In relation to the blind spot bias, this is, this is a core bias that is very common to human um, behavior, very common to human interactions. And 
it's this urge, this urge to be right and this belief that we are right, that we have all the information, that we're making the best decision, that we are not biased. Uh, and the core fallacy there is that is a misunderstanding of biases and of how the brain works and because the reality is is that we are all biased we all have biases we all respond automatically to our environment because that is the way our brains have evolved to adapt to our environments and so no one is above this. No one can say, like, I am completely unbiased all the time. That is false. We are all biased in some way all the time. You can become more aware. You can um, take action to prevent biases or to mitigate the impact they have on your decisions. But the reality and the, the truth of the matter is that we are all biased. And while we all want to be right, and there's this, there's this urge, there's this connection, um, you know, there's this like uh, response within your brain and with your body that, you know, as things come in, if the information matches previously held information, then it's, you know, then you have, then there's a positive reinforced feel like, oh, matches, yep, match to same, match to same, good, good, good. Um, and then you have the information, the information that doesn't match, information that doesn't match is bad. Well, if your model that your, you know, your sample to which this information is being matched or compared, is not accurate, then you're simply just reinforcing inaccurate information. So again, we are all we are all biased. The strategies that are recommended, important, effective to overcome this human tendency to believe that we are right, we have all the information that we are not biased, um, is to first learn about cognitive biases. So the, fir the first step in solving a problem or overcoming a problem is awareness. We need to know that, we need to understand the nature of the problem. And if you don't know anything about cognitive biases, you're, you don't have that information, you don't have that core set of information. So you need to learn about cognitive biases and you need to learn about psychological flexibility in order to come to the clear understanding that there's there's more that you don't know than you know and it's your responsibility as a an integral part of the systems in which you function to take action to prevent the impact of cognitive biases on decision making and prevent judgment errors and disasters that are preventable. We cannot prevent every disaster, but there are a lot of disasters that we could, that could have been prevented had we been aware of the cognitive biases that were in play and taken action to mitigate their impact. So the first step, learning that information. This takes me right back to that idea that I had, you know, at the very beginning, which was that um, I, you know, I personally had a general idea that cognitive biases were a thing and somehow they were related to, you know, decision making, but because I hadn't read the book, because I hadn't consumed the information and integrated that information into the way that I see and think about the world, I was not able to apply that information, right? 
you can't apply skills and knowledge if you don't first have the skills and knowledge. So step one, gather the information, actually consume it, learn about it, know these things. How do we go about knowing things? How do we integrate this information effectively into who we are and what we do in the daily decision make, decisions that we make? Well, reading, reading the book is the first step. But in order to solidify this knowledge, then for, your, you know, for yourself, you need to develop additional strategies to um, make this knowledge concrete and easily accessible and um, flexibly usable within your, within your environment. So what does that look like? What, what strategies works for you? You know, I can't, I can't dictate the, what is going to work for you, but one thing that comes to mind is going back to the very you know, basic building blocks of learning new information is to develop fluency in um, the identification and discussion of these concepts. And so fluency-based training, precision, precision teaching, precision learning, being able to um, you know, fluently respond and um, apply the skills, you know, there's the retention, endurance, application, um, of these skills to the um, to your life situations is going to take um, us learning them to the point where we can fluently access that information, and that comes through kind of self learning. So learning to learn strategies, learning how to um, for yourself solidify information and make it usable. Um, the second, the uh, second key core cognitive bias that presented a gigantic issue for the, for myself in general and for the organization and the system in which we found ourselves, you know, being within the kind of that oyster farming family business um, environment. Overconfidence was a huge issue that impacted us. And it's also a very common issue to the general, the general population. Um, you know, we have a tendency to, rather than um, effectively communicating and collaborating and you know, bringing in people, all this information, so we can have our maximal um, acceleration trend it's very common to kind of get wrapped up in your own thought process, in your own head, in your own um, problem solving, and you know you've gathered all of this information. I, I know I I know everything that I need to know, and I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to take charge, and I'm going to go with it. That has been a problem for me and the team in which I found myself in um, when we moved up here was very very similar. Um, behavioral characteristics that many of the team members were that same um, type of person to, who are overconfident. I've got my idea. I know what we're doing. We're going to do this and we're going to charge ahead without having those conversations and developing the consensus that is necessary to move forward in an effective way. So the key to overcoming overconfidence really is to seek and consider the pers others, the perspectives of others. And this takes development of an ability to more effectively communicate your points and, um, uh, and to make sure that, um, not one person is taking responsibility of, of making the decisions and and for and forcing the charge, making sure that everybody is coming to the table and um, and making those decisions together, which takes the setting of policies to guide that and policies and procedures to guide that process 
of decision making and of action planning to ensure that in it there are steps in place to involve everybody. Um, another really big issue that impacted us as an organization and as a team was the IKEA effect, and this um, relates to overconfidence in that you know, each of us as individuals was so confident in our perspective and our ideas and, you know, this is what we're doing. And so each person would come to a meeting kind of with their, you know, rock brain, this is my idea, this is what we're doing. And everybody else would have their own individual perspective of, you know, what, what was going on and what they were going to, that they were going to do that we didn't effectively communicate and collaborate on a decision and a plan um, and actively listen to others. And so, you know, this really pointed to me and reflecting back on and kind of assessing that situation, it really pointed to the importance of including all stakeholders in all conversations, in all decision making. Um, in personal life, in business, in clinical work, in any decision, any problem that you're trying to solve, if it is you and you alone who is coming up with plans and then working to influence others to get on board with your plan, that is generally an indicator that the, the people who should have been involved in making the plan, which, which would have in, um, instilled and engendered a more buy-in from all of the stakeholders that wasn't that wasn't done and so the strategies of delaying decision making and including all stakeholders bringing everybody to the table actively listening making sure that you're gathering perspectives from everyone and getting everyone involved in the process of making this decision to ensure that every person feels as though their voice has been heard, their ideas have been incorporated and listened to, and then the team, that team dynamic can develop into, um, like develop into a strong system in which every person, every, every person feels heard and valued and part of, part of the process and will be more invested overall in the outcome and take more effective action as a system. It was really interesting to me that the illusory truth effect came out as one of the key issues um, because while I thought about this as a problem, I didn't before reading this book and learning more about cognitive biases and reflecting upon how they um, impact and have impacted me and my decision making, I don't, I didn't really realize how impactful repeated lies are on, um, on a system. Um, because it doesn't necessarily have to be a big lie or something that's, you know, could be a, a half truth. But when things are repeated over and over and over, it becomes the reality. It becomes what people believe to be true. So even if it's not completely true, um, if things are repeated often, it becomes perceived as the truth. And, you know, while our brains are very complex organs, they are very simple in some ways in, in the um, illusory truth effect brings that to bear and brings that to light for me. Because, you know, every time you receive a piece of information, if it matches previously information that is straight, you know, it, it reinforces that pattern. If it doesn't match, then it doesn't reinforce it. Um, or, the, you know, that, that information is discarded. And so the stronger a thought pattern becomes, 
because it's been heard more times, right? So every time you perceive it, it's like just one more connection in that pathway. Then when con contrasting information comes in, the stronger that that connection is, the less likely it is that that contrasting information is going to be integrated into um, kind of your understanding. It's going to be kind of rejected forthright. So when you hear, when there's kind of the same messages repeated over and over, it becomes reality and we become less aware of the um, of the disconnect or the or the um, untruth of it and so this is this is a time or these, these are situations in which where you know the idea or the title of the book is never go with your gut that doesn't mean that your gut doesn't provide you with some critical information. So you need to listen to your gut, but you, don't but you don't go with it, right? So you listen to it because your body and your brain automatically responds to those things. So if something's not adding up, if there is some sort of dissonance that you're sensing, you're thinking, feeling, something doesn't seem right. I just keep coming back to like my brain just keeps coming back to like I there's something I don't know what it is but there's something that is an indicator right that's a cue a physiological neurobiological whatever you want to call it it is a cue to you that something is not quite right and you need to look deeper you need to investigate the source of that dissonance um, to really come to the truth of the matter. Because if you, if your brain and your body is responding in some way, like nah, mm -mm, something's not quite right, that again, that is your, that's your yellow flag, that's your warning signal, that's your, you know, that's the light that comes on. But we but it takes more than just, you know, it, it, oh, the wheel squeaks, put grease on it. It takes more than just that initial thought about what the problem is. It takes some investigation to dig a little bit deeper into that. And then the final, the final cognitive bias that, um, that came out to be one that was most negatively impacting our system and our organization was the normalcy bias because we didn't have a contingency plan. We didn't have a contingency plan for um, unexpected or unprobable bad things. And we didn't have a, con a contingency plan for unprobable or unexpected good things. Um, and that led to very, very predictable problems. Again, in the moment, we didn't know, we didn't see it. We were just acting, re reacting, responding reflexively. Um, autom you know, functioning in autopilot all the time. Um, but the problem was that not only was there no backup plan, there really was no solid plan plan. And that this points to dramatically when you, you know, when you're going to, when you're able to hear the whole story and see the big picture, it, be, it comes, becomes glaringly obvious that the team and the system in which we found ourselves, there, there was no planning. There was no contingency planning. There was no strategic planning. There was no collaborative problem solving. There was no probabilistic thinking. There was no um, open, honest communication about what was going on, what was the source of the problems, what were the potential things that we could do. There was none of that. And it and there was none of that for a specific reason, for a couple specific reasons. The team members didn't have the necessary or the requisite skills 
in order to engage in the collaborative problem solving. And there was no cohesive group motivation to address that core problem. And that was the situation in which we found ourselves was that, you know, there was tons of catastrophic judgment errors happening. There was tons of cognitive biases which were impacting us. And while at the very core, you know, we all knew that something was wrong, but we didn't know what was wrong. So we kept fighting for answers, struggling for solutions, throwing spaghetti at the wall, fighting, you know, fighting, fleeing, freezing, and functioning in a manner in which we were not able to effectively or efficiently address the problems we were facing, which led to a situation in which we were unable to move forward as a system and the system as a result fell apart. And that's, and that's where we found ourselves. And we'll continue over the, over the course of this course, we'll continue to explore that story and what all of the things happened and kind of how things came to be and how things came to pass and how the issues with cognitive biases and collaborative problem solving and probabilistic thinking and open and honest communication really all kind of coalesced and came together in this um, perfect storm from which we emerged stronger and from which we can learn some really, really important lessons in order to plan for how to make more effective decisions moving forward to prevent preventable problems and to maximize our possibility for success. So next week we are going to be <clears throat> kind of moving from book one, Never Go With Your Gut, into the second book, which is The Paradox of Organizational Change, in which we will begin to look at behavioral systems analysis and think about systems in a different way. So we have kind of our, you know, the traditional way of looking at businesses, system, businesses and systems and strategic planning and mission statements and vision and um, kind of reorienting our conceptualization of behavioral systems and refining our thoughts about how important each step of the process is to ensure that we are setting ourselves and our organizations and our systems up for success when it comes to making the changes necessary to evolve and adapt and grow and move forward in a more smooth, fluent, effective, and efficient way. So the readings for next week will be the first three chapters of the book Paradox for Organizational Change. And there are the exercises from this um, lesson to complete as well as some feedback to give. So with that, I wish you all a very um, wonderful day and I hope you have a great day and a great weekend. And I look forward to continuing to guide you on the path towards more effective and efficient decision making when it comes to um, yourself and your family and your community in the service of creating peace. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.